So I think did every or a lot of people got a copy of the word for our the year the where the promise marries the power. Selena, I think passed those out last week. Did everybody get a copy of that? Good. I think it's you guys. You guys are on the phone. <laughs> wow. Got it. I'll go make a copy. There's a few more back yes. there. Oh, okay. Come Sweet. On. Thank you, ma'am. Got mine. Thank you. So, what Yolanda had asked me to do a while back was she asked me to to sort of teach on this word, and so I want to talk about uh, prophetic words in general. You know, when God releases a prophetic word. Um, a lot of times, there's several different purposes, but there's there's two purposes that I've been thinking about lately, and one of those purposes is to build your structure with. And this is the year we're talking a lot about building the house. So when he gives us a word, it's almost like it's a foundation level upon which we're going to build our house. We're going to build the things for that year that we're going to look at, that we're going to teach on, that we're going to go after. So that's one of the purposes. And another purpose I believe in giving a word is prophetic words are almost like footholds. So if you look at it like you're climbing a mountain, you know, and you're, you're, you're going up the mountain, you need a solid place to put your foot on and to push off from. You need something solid. And so that's what a prophetic word does. It's this thing that God provides, provides us periodically. And we look at it and we go, okay, that's something we can stand on. That's something we can stand on. And you're standing not just to stay in that place, but you're standing so you can push off and you can move to that next place. And a lot of times, God will give us prophetic words periodically. And the new word doesn't necessarily do away with the old word. So sometimes that's a little bit confusing. You know, we have this word from last year. And so we'll be like, okay, we're going to put that word away and we're just going to focus on the word for this year. But that's not usually how God works. Usually when he gives us one word, then the next word builds on that. It adds to that. It gives us another piece uh, in that to build our structure. It gives us another foothold to go higher. So we don't ever want to forget about those, those past words that he's given us as a body and even in our own lives. So the footholds, I think, are a really... A good illustration of where we should be moving as the body of Christ because we should be moving up the glory mountain we should be uh, moving from glory to glory and in this season he's revealing and he's unveiling a lot of things that in the past seasons have been hidden from us they're not necessarily new truths because everything was created from the foundation of the earth but they're they've been hidden because it wasn't the time for them to be revealed. So what he's doing in this season is he's lifting veils and he's revealing things so we can have the pieces that we need to move on up that glory mountain. And so we talk a lot about the glory mountain. We say, okay, we're moving up the glory mountain, but what's our goal? Where are we moving to? Well, the top of the glory mountain is Zion. And I heard Yolanda mention Zion on Sunday, and I didn't get to hear what she said about it because I went to the restroom at that time so but I thought it was interesting I just heard her say those words and that very night before in the middle of the night the Holy Spirit had woke me up and what he was talking to me about was Zion was about Mount Zion so what is Zion Zion is a place where God is enthroned and where God dwells so there's a really awesome picture of this in Isaiah chapter 2 verses 2 through 3 and I actually gave this a scripture to a church last summer that I had given a prophetic word to and I saw this in their church I saw this is what God had called them to in Isaiah chapter 2 verse 2 says in the last days the mountain of Yahweh's temple will be raised up as the head of the mountains towering over all the hills a sparkling stream of every nation will flow into it many peoples will come and say Everyone come, let's go up higher to Yahweh's mountain, to the house of Jacob's God. Then he can teach us his ways and we can walk in his paths. Zion will be the center of instruction and the word of Yahweh will go out from Jerusalem. And I love in the Passion Translation, and I'm just going to read this, the footnote 
for that verse is Zion is more than a location. It's a realm where God is enthroned. Zion is a synonym for the people of God in the dwelling place of his spirit. The perfection of beauty is in Mount Zion where the light of God shines. Perfected praise rises to the Lord in this place of perfect rest. The mountain of Zion is where the Lord is known in his greatness and it is the hope of all the afflicted. Isn't that cool? That's just a picture of what we want this house to look like. A place of hope, a place of rest, a place of praise, a place of glory, a place of his presence. So that is what we're working for. That is why we're moving up the mountain. That is the state of abiding in that place, in that Zion that we're trying to create on earth, that we're partnering with him to create. So I believe that the words that he gives us are to move us to that place. So that's one reason why I want to focus on this word that he's given us for this year. So I read it a few weeks ago, but I want to actually just read this word again. Your journey towards freedom has led you down a path to power and authority. You're now ready to display my power as you embrace the fullness of your authority. This will be a year to learn about power. I will teach you to be a conduit for my power and a carrier of my glory. Veils are being removed and you'll see more clearly. What you didn't understand before or where you saw no answer will suddenly look very different. I'm giving you new solutions for old problems. Don't reject the simple and the pure because you're looking for the sophisticated. When you see it, there will be so much agreement in your spirit that it will feel as though it's been there all along, and it has. Your spirit will recognize the eternal truths that have been hidden from you until this time. Because what good would these powerful truths have been to you if you had no way to unwrap them and put them to use? Enjoy the unwrapping, because part of my pleasure comes from giving and watching you discover. I could make it appear, but the rewards will be greater when I allow you to find it. I will guide you in a new way in this season. I will not call to you from the next location or destination, but instead I will walk beside you as you step into your place as my mature bride. You don't need my voice as you did before. You will know my thoughts as our movements become synchronized as two become one. Guard the house. You can't be effective and efficient warriors if all your time between battles is spent rebuilding the house. Ask me and I'll show you what is yours to guard. This year will reveal the next generation prophetic. It will be a time where seeing becomes being. No longer will the prophetic voice just say what they see. Now you will see what you say. This year, the promise will marry the power. Alone, they are limited, but in covenant, they are phenomenal. Promises without power become stagnant pools of hopelessness. But when the two converge, a mighty flowing river of life will flood the land. Last year, you fought for freedom, but this year you'll fight with freedom. The victory you won will now become the weapon you'll wield. Freedom for you means freedom for me. Because how can I release riches from heaven to those who are bound in captivity? They would just be plundered by your captor, the enemy. But now you're free to receive heaven's bounty. So position yourselves to receive, receive, receive. Your word for the year is power. Because you're entering with freedom, you can now carry the power. But don't seek the power, seek the source, and the power will flow freely. And in Acts 1.8, the word says, But I promise you this, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and you will be seized with power, and you will be my messengers to Jerusalem, throughout Judea, and the distant provinces, even to the remotest places on the earth. So the reason why I wanted to read this again and I wanted everyone to have a copy is because I believe that everyone has a piece that they can add. 
everyone is prophetic and we have a prophetic atmosphere a prophetic culture in this house and that means that everything we do we have a thread of the prophetic flowing through it and the prophetic in its very simplest form is just hearing just receiving and releasing the heart of god and so i want you guys to take this word with you and i want you to pray over it and if holy spirit gives you something I want you to give it back to me. Either shoot me an email or a text message or write it down and, and give it to me when you see me. And don't be scared of being wrong. This is a really safe place to practice our gifts. And, and one of those is moving in the prophetic because we have a strong prophetic anointing in this house. And anytime you have a strong gift, that means it's a safe place for other people to practice their gifts even if they aren't so strong. So if you bring something that's a little bit off and it's not right, that's okay because we have that covering. It's not going to damage anyone. It's not going to do anything terrible because we have that strong, solid covering and we have that strong apostolic foundation that it can cover that because we are a training house and that's what we're here for. And so as long as your heart is right, don't ever be afraid of being wrong because there's grace in the training period. There's grace in that time. So when I asked Holy Spirit what he wanted us to look at with this word, because he's teaching us to really unpack, and just as he talked about in this word, he wants us to unwrap the gifts that he gives us. And so when Yolanda asked me at some point, she said at some point she wanted me to sort of unpack and teach on this word. So I asked Holy Spirit, uh, what do you want me to talk about? And so I was excited. I was like, okay, we're gonna hear about the power. I'm ready to learn about the power because a lot of times I get words, but it doesn't necessarily mean I know how to walk them out. Um, that's a whole different thing. You receive the word, but then you see how does that word apply? Um, how do you steward that word? What do you do with that word? And that's a journey. And so I was thinking, all right, we're going to get some more revelation on the power. But that's not what Holy Spirit said. He said, before you could walk in the power, you have to get a greater understanding of the freedom. And if you remember our word from last year, we had it hanging there in the back all year. Say that again, what you just said, before you can walk in. Before you can walk in the fullness of power, you have to walk, you have to walk in the fullness of freedom. And so again, we're building. So yes, freedom was our word for last year, but that doesn't mean we just forget about the freedom piece. Um, that means he's saying we need to get a little more of the freedom piece. And that's not something that we're going to get it and then we're done with it. It's like the more freedom you get, then the more you realize you have things to be free from and free to. So that's a continual thing. This walk of freedom is going to be a continual thing no matter what other th things he gives us to do. So we talk a lot about freedom. And right now in our society, freedom is a hot topic. It's hot. I mean, you just turn on the news. You just turn on social media. Everybody's talking about freedom. Their freedoms being taken away, you know, their freedoms being stolen, they want their freedoms. What is their freedom? A lot of times, if you look at that, the world's definition of freedom is my rights, what's being taken from me. And a lot of times, in the world's view of freedom, uh, if I get to keep my freedom, someone else loses their freedom. It's a bartering system who has the strongest power to barter for that freedom. But one thing I've realized. In, in God's kingdom, it's always a win-win situation. It doesn't have to be someone wins and someone loses, other than the darkness and the demons and principalities, and they're always going to lose. But when it comes to God's children, there's always going to be a way for everyone to walk in their freedom. It might not look the way some people think it looks, but if they're truly walking according to God's plan and God's heart, they're going to be able to walk in freedom. Their, their freedom isn't going to be stolen from them. So I want to take a deeper look at freedom. The dictionary describes freedom as a state of exemption from the power or control of another, especially exemption from slavery, servitude, or confinement. And also it's the ease of, of being able to do something or liberty. The Greek word for freedom is eleutheria, E-L-E-U-T-H-E-R-I-A. And that word literally means liberty or freedom. And, and especially, that word is focusing especially on from slavery, from bondage. But there's actually six Hebrew words for the concept of freedom. 
But today I just want to talk to you about a couple of them. Kofesh, which is C-H-O-F-E-S-H, is that same uh, type of meaning from that Greek word. It's the freedom of, that a slave requi- acquires when he's no longer has a master. So he's liberated from bondage. So it's freedom from external restraints. But there's another freedom that is talked about using a Hebrew word, and it's sherut, C-H-E-R-U-T. And this was a little bit different type of freedom. It wasn't just freedom from slavery, but, uh, and I'm going to just read this definition. The freedom the Israelites acquired at Mount Sinai in the form of a covenant was this type of freedom, this sherut. God's message to Pharaoh was clearly one of Sherut. Let my people go that they might worship me. Um, so it, God just didn't want people to be released from slavery. He wanted them to also have the choice to choose covenant with him. And we know that there's freedom in God. There's, there's freedom in covenant. So... It allowed, this type of freedom allowed them to be free from their slavery, but it also allowed them to be bound to God and to his commandments. So one of the rabbis spoke this phrase, and I think this is so true, that freedom without purpose is slavery. Freedom without purpose is slavery. So if the children of Israel would just have gotten released from their slavery, and that's the only type of freedom they would have gotten, and they wouldn't stepped into that covenant uh, with God, they still really wouldn't have been free. So I didn't discover these word meanings until after I had meditated on freedom some, and what Holy Spirit was bringing me, and then I found that these words really described it perfectly, he was showing me that there's actually a freedom from, and there's a freedom to, and that's two different things. There's, there's a freedom from something. So that's that liberty. That's that being free from slavery or, or oppression. But there's also a freedom to do something. And I think that a lot of times as Christians, we focus a lot on the freedom from. And a lot of times um, that's a lot of our healing and our deliverance is what we're looking at. We're looking at that freedom from, and that's a huge piece. We absolutely have to have that. But then we don't know what to do after that. And so God doesn't look at our freedom. And once we're free, he doesn't look at us and go, oh, I'm so happy. My little children are free. I'm going to set them up here on the mantle like a trophy and I'm going to admire them. No, his purpose for us to have freedom from things is so we have freedom to do things for him. And so I think that... um, we're selling ourselves short if we don't take that next step. If we don't take that next step in after we get that freedom, after we get that deliverance, then there's a next step in discipleship. And that's, okay, what do we do now? What do we do with this freedom? Um, part of that is maintaining and keeping that freedom. Another part of that is discovering what is God's plan for my life? What does my covenant relationship with him now look like? What does that covenant give me the freedom to do? in my life, in this world, in my calling. One of the things um, that we need to understand about freedom is that freedom doesn't come through the law of the land saying we can, can or can't do certain things. Freedom doesn't come by being able to quit a job by a lot of the ways we see freedom. But true freedom comes through Jesus. And in Galatians 4, uh, verses, verse 4 through 5, Paul says, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the written law. Yet all of this was so that he could redeem and set free all those held hostage to the written law so that we would receive our freedom and a full legal adoption as his children. And Galatians 5, 1 says, Let me be clear. The anointing, anointed one has set us free, not partially, but completely and wonderfully free. We must always cherish this truth and stubbornly refuse to go back into the bondage of our past. I was talking to someone last week, Sunday, and they shared with me a story of how 
they had received so much uh, victory and so much freedom. And then that very week, there was an attack that just seemed just like it had in the past. And momentarily, it took them back to that place. It took them back to that place of those same reactions, uh, physical reactions, those same emotional reactions. And so that's why I love this verse. It says, we must always cherish this truth and stubbornly refuse to go back into the bondage of our past. That's about maintaining our deliverance. That's about maintaining our victories. And I think a lot of times, myself included, when we go into battle, I mean, we really we're charged up we're ready to do this thing we're ready to win we win that battle and then we kind of step back and we go that's over with and we relax and then the enemy sneaks in he's always going to do it you know Yolanda (laughs) talks about it she uses the word test we're always going to be tested in those areas that that we've made uh, obtained victory but he's always going to come in and try to take back what we have so there I know a lot of times we want to move forward and we don't want to maintain, but we have to maintain. Remember this word? Part of this word is guard the house. Guard the house. You can't be effective, efficient warriors if all your time between battles is spent rebuilding the house. So the pieces in the house are the things that we've taken from the enemy. They're our victories. They're our prize from the battles. We can't be, every time we go out for a new battle, we can't be given those away. So we're going to ask the Lord, what does this look like? He said, ask me and I'll show you what is yours to guard. So in this season, in this year, in these next few months and days days and you know months, we're going to ask the Lord, what does that look like? Is this an individual thing? Do we set up a team that that's their job is to go? You know, we say, here's the victories we have. That, you know, I don't know what that looks like. But we're going to walk that out together because we have to stubbornly refuse to go back. Freedom is, is where the Lord is. In 2 Corinthians 3, 16, Paul says, But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So whenever we invite the Spirit of the Lord into our house, into our lives, into any situation where we're in, there's going to be freedom. These are just some attributes about freedom that I'm actually sharing with you. So the first one is freedom comes through Jesus. The second one I want to look at is something that freedom does for us. It allows us to come boldly and confidently into God's presence. So, you know, in the Old Testament, um, it was just the priests that got to do that. It, it, they, the regular Joe didn't have that freedom to come into God's presence. Ephesians 3, uh, 11 says this perfectly wise plan was destined from eternal ages and fulfilled completely in our Lord Jesus Christ so that now we have boldness through him and free access as kings before the Father because of our complete confidence in Christ's faithfulness. So that phrase boldness through him, the Greek words used here can also be translated freedom of speech to say whatever you want with boldness. So because of our covenant with Jesus Christ, we have freedom to come boldly into the presence of God and to speak what's on our heart with confidence. Freedom also gives us boldness to speak the truth to the worldly leaders. So not only to our Heavenly Father, not only to God, but if you look in Psalms 119, uh, verses 45 through 46, this is what the Word says, I will walk with you in complete freedom. For I seek to follow your every command. When I stand before kings, I will tell them the truth and I will never be ashamed. Isn't that cool? Because I walk in freedom, I can stand before the kings, the leaders, the worldly leaders of this world, and I can speak the truth of the gospel of Christ and I won't be ashamed. So we're in a season where we need some freedom to rise up and speak the truth to our leaders. We need the freedom to rise up and to step into those places in this world of worldly leaders and speak God's kingdom wisdom. Um, A lot of you guys I know are in those positions where you have spoke up and you've said, this isn't right. You know, I'm going to speak the truth to you and I'm going to speak the truth to you in love. So that's what the freedom through Christ brings is that ability to speak to leaders. This freedom also gives us... um, 
the opportunity to choose. Romans 6.18, Paul says, Don't you realize that grace frees you to choose your own master? But choose carefully, for you surrender yourself to become a servant, bound to the one you choose to obey. If you choose to love sin, it will become your master, and it will own you and reward you with death. But if you choose to love and obey God, he will lead you into perfect righteousness. So it gives us the opportunity to choose, and most specifically, it gives us the opportunity to choose a life free from sin and a life full of holiness. And the one thing the enemy wants to do is to back us into positions in our lives where we don't think we have a choice. That is an age-old tactic that he does. And I'm telling you, I've been in those situations, and they look tough, and they look like there is no choice. There's no way out. And that's usually in my mind, when my mind is rationalizing it, and my mind is trying to figure it out. And there is no way out, according to my mind, and according to my processing and my thinking. But the freedom that Christ gives us, He always gives us a choice. And if we're in a situation in our lives where we're living in sin, there is a choice. And there is a freedom in Christ to make that choice. Romans 6.22 says, But now as God's loving servants, you live in joyous freedom from the power of sin. So consider the benefits you now enjoy. You are brought deeper into the experience of true holiness that ends in eternal life. And John 8.34 says, I speak eternal truth. Jesus said, When you sin, you are not free. You become a slave in bondage to your sin. And slaves have no permanent standing in a family like a son does. For a son is a part of the family forever. So if the son sets you free from sin, then become a true son and be unquestionably free. And I love this part that freedom is actually our destiny. Freedom is the place that God wants us all to get to. And our destiny, it's it's and it's not just our destiny, I could probably add to this freedom is our inheritance. It's our destiny and our inheritance. Our inheritance is something that you're guaranteed. That you're guaranteed from uh, from your father, from your family. Romans 8, 18, and we've all heard this verse. Paul is speaking. He said, I'm convinced that any sufferings we endure is less than nothing compared to the magnitude of glory that is about to be unveiled within us. The entire universe is standing on tiptoe, yearning to see the unveiling of God's glorious sons and daughters. For against its will, the universe itself has had to endure the empty futility resulting from the consequences of human sin. But now, with eager expectation, all creation longs for freedom from its slavery to decay and to experience with us the wonderful freedom coming to God's children. So freedom is coming. Freedom, absolute freedom is coming when Jesus comes back. But we also have the opportunity to step into that freedom and walk in that freedom today here on earth. And that is our job. That is our role. That's what we're supposed to do. So once we receive that freedom and experience that freedom, the word also says that it's good news and it should be shared with others. We shouldn't just keep it to ourselves. And we're doing that in a lot of ways. Through our deliverance ministry, that's what we're doing. We're sharing. We're saying we've experienced this and we want you to experience that too through our worship ministry, that's what we're doing. We say we, we, we as a worship team have experienced the freedom of coming boldly into the throne room of God. And we want to open up the atmosphere and we want to help you. Through the teaching, um, that's what we're doing. We're trying to impart to people. So uh, Isaiah 61 verse 1 says, and, and this is what Jesus came to do, but this is also should be our mission as well. The mighty spirit of Lord Yahweh or the spirit of prophecy, is wrapped around me because Yahweh has anointed me as a messenger to preach good news to the poor, which is the humble, the lowly, the, dep- the depressed. And he sent me to heal the wounds of the brokenhearted, to tell captives, you are free, and to tell prisoners, be free from your darkness. So that should be our mission as individuals. Um, that should be our mission corporately in this house. And that should be our kingdom mission, is to set people free. So if freedom is so awesome, then why do so many people stay in bondage? Why do they stay in slavery? We could talk about that for a long time. Um, There's a lot of reasons why people do. Um, This isn't even on my list, but I think probably the biggest reason is fear. 
<coughs> fear is huge, and fear is always going to be a tactic that the enemy is going to use to try to keep us uh, from fulfilling our destiny. But one of the things that I began to think about when I was thinking about freedom, and it sort of came to me through a different route. I didn't even see it as having anything to do with freedom. But what it is, is it's our perceived identity, like who we think we are. So our freedom can be restricted through our perceived identity. Um, so let me, let me show you what this looks like. And the Holy Spirit actually woke me up in the middle of the night last week, and he was talking to me about this. So for the past 23 years, I've been a counselor. A licensed professional counselor. I practiced in uh, community mental health for a while, and then I moved into the school system. And so that was my identity. You know, when you meet someone and you introduce yourself, a lot of times people say, what do you do? What is, what is your role? Where do you work? And I would say, well, I'm, I'm a counselor. And sometimes I would get clumped into the, I'm a teacher, and I would just leave it at that, you know, which I, I never actually taught in a classroom, but it was close enough. It was their understanding of I'm in a school system. But if it got, the, you know, deeper into the conversation, well, I'm a school counselor, and, and that, that's what I do. So uh, that's, that's what I did for 23 years. So as of about seven or eight weeks ago, when I retired from that, I don't have that identity anymore. And it's been wonderful, by the way. You guys are walking this out with me. I, I absolutely love it. It's incredible. Um, I'm getting some new revelation about it that I'll, I'll share shortly. But um, I've, I've loved it. But it's also been challenging. It's been challenging. Um, there, there's been some things about it that, that I didn't expect. I was dropping off. My daughter-in-law took a job at the OSU Foundation, a new job there a few weeks ago. And I wanted to deliver some flowers to her. And I thought, well, I have time. I'll go to uh, whatever it's called now, Homeland, or it changes. This whatever. week it's Homeland. This week it's Homeland. <laughs> <laughs> Which they have really nice flowers, by the way. Yeah. Their florist is doing a great job. They're beautiful, good price. So I went there, and they don't. They didn't deliver. I didn't know if they did or not, but they, they don't deliver. So I was like, it's okay, I have time. You know, I'll just drop it off. I've discovered the art of piddling. <laughs> you guys, does anybody know the art of piddling? It's an art. <laughs> Years of practice. <laughs> it, it is. I didn't know. It, it's a thing. It's a thing. It's like you kind of have an idea. Okay, these are the things I want to accomplish. But in the in the past season, I would be like, bam, bam, bam. You know, knocking things out. Really intentional. Like this is what I'm gonna do this day. But in the art of piddling. It's like you realize I'm already at Lowe's and it's 7.30. I'm here with the contractor crowd, you know, and I'm just walking, meandering through the aisles, like not just busting it. Because usually when I went to Lowe's to work on a project, I'd have to run in at 4.30 after school, grab what I need, you know, for a rent house, try to figure out. But it's just really cool just to walk through. <laughs> like I'm not in a huge hurry, you know. Yeah, I'd like to get this house ready to rent by the first, but, you know, I'm the one working on it, so it's my time frame. It's an interesting thing. We put a lot of constraints and restraints on ourselves that other people don't put on us, and it's hard to bust out of that. And that's kind of where I am now. So anyway, piddling means picking up flowers and driving over and figuring out where to park in the foundation and walking in and delivering to the secretary. Can you give these to my daughter-in-law? So I did that. As I walked out, just something hit me. And, and all of a sudden, I, I was like, wait a minute, I have time to drop off flowers in the middle of the day. That secretary probably thinks, who is she? What is she doing with her life? Why isn't she at work? Why is she, no, literally, these are the thoughts that came to me. Why is she dropping off flowers in the middle of the day? What does she do? And then all of a sudden I thought, what what do I do? <laughs> I, don't, I don't do anything. I piddle. <laughs> you should try it. If you haven't tried it, it's interesting. It's a, it's a learned art. You have to... I can write out some instructions sometime. But... <laughs> <laughs> You're working at it too hard. Yeah, yeah that's, right. Right. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. You haven't quite mastered it. Well, it's, right it's taken a lot of self-control. <laughs> <laughs> it takes a lot of self-control to learn to piddle well. Yeah. So <laughs> it just hit me. Maybe some of y'all who have been doing it longer need to give me some advice. <laughs> But it hit me when I walked out of there. I was like, 
I don't have a job. Uh, what What is my job? And then it hit me, did I really just quit my job? Like it's been seven weeks, or probably six weeks at that time. And like it was, the realization of that just hit me. I was like, oh my goodness, what did I do? Did I really do that? Because I think in the moment of things, you know, there's just so much going on. And then those days and those weeks afterwards, I was just like, um, there was a lot of stuff I had to do. There was a lot of physical th- th- things I had to do with, you know, uh, benefits, re- retirement, and, you know, insurances and accounts. I was shifting assets around. The Lord had given me some strategy to shift some assets around, and I was selling some things and, and doing some things. And so those first few weeks were just crazy busy. And then I went right into a pretty big rent house project, and that was you know, pretty, I need to get that done. So like, that was the first time I had just taken a breath and thought, wow, what am I doing? And so in that moment, I realized I didn't know what my identity was. I was like, who am I? I'm nobody. I'm not a, a teacher. I'm not a counselor. I'm, I'm, I'm not, you know, what, what am I? And so I think a lot of times society puts a lot of emphasis on who we are, what we do, what our, our role is in the world, um, what our role is in, in society. Um, and I think a lot of times there's definitions for those roles. And so whether or not we realize it, we get to a place where we live up to those definitions. We live our lives in a way that, that uh, we follow the rules of that certain occupation or of that certain career or of that certain identity, whatever it is. Um, so I think a lot, of t- and a lot of times those rules are man's rules. They're not God's rules. They're man's rules. But we are just, our minds are so trained to think that way that we don't think outside that box. So let me give you an example in, in my career field. So in counseling, there's certain parameters and there's certain guidelines. And they have certain guidelines about dual relationships. And these have changed over the years. They've actually gotten a little bit less strict since, since I've been in community mental health. But uh, in the beginning, they were very, very strict. And then there still are a lot of rules. And so uh, one of the rules might be, for example, if I have a client and I have a counseling session with them on, on Monday, then I'm really not free to meet that client and have a casual lunch with them on Tuesday. That would be considered a dual relationship. And, and there's, there's good things about some of these rules, okay? So I'm not saying they're all bad because there are good things uh, and, and there's reasons why and there's a safe, it's safety for both the therapist and the client. But it also restrains us in a lot of ways. And I'm just using this as an example. I'm not saying they should do away with all the rules. But I want you to look at this in a different perspective with me. If, if I counsel Selena on Monday, not that she would have anything she would need counseling for, but if I counsel Selena on Monday, and Selena and I want to go have lunch on Tuesday, or maybe right after that, then we're free to do that. Maybe Selena's going to counsel me on Wednesday. (laughs) That's kind of how that goes. So that's not not a dual relationship. So what I just want you to see is a lot of times we live in under rules that's man's rules, and it's not God's rules. And I think we're in a season where we need to step back and we need to go, are we functioning under society's rules? or under kingdom rules. And I realize that there's a certain honoring and a certain respect. And if we want to live under their system and work under their system, then we need to honor that. But I think what God is doing in this season is showing us that we don't have to live under the world systems. We don't have to look to the world to be our provider to give us the provision that we need. So I think that he's trying to shift us and he's trying to shift our mindsets to show us that there's so many things in life that we think that we have to do. You know, we have to do this. And 
you know, I like to know what the rules are, okay? So, some people say, well, I'm a rule follower, but really, I do want to know what the rules are. This drives your land crazy. I like, what are the rules? I want to know what the rules are, but it doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to follow them. It's kind of more like, <laughs> Selena, what's that? Like, I mean, I, I want to, just because I want to know what they are doesn't mean I'm going to do it, but maybe I just. <laughs> <laughs> you want to know what to expect when you get punished. I just want to know what to expect if I don't do it. That's all I want to know. Is it worth it? Just tell me what's the rule and what's the consequence, and then I'll decide if it's worth it. So. <laughs> we'll just call you Daniel. Sometimes it, I've thought it was worth it, and I might not be, especially if it's with Yolanda. You better think hard, long and hard if it's worth it. <laughs> I love her. But anyway, it's really usually worth it to see the look on her face. But anyway, <laughs> so <laughs> a lot of times there are rules in society, and we think we have to follow those rules. But I'm here to tell you, and I'm discovering this. I'm on this walk myself. There's very few things in life that we absolutely have to do. Very few. Now, we may think we have to do them because if we don't do them, such and such happens, but we still have a choice. You know, I was talking to a friend last week and, and they called me, they had a situation in their life and it looked like there was no choice. It looked like there was no out. And so we just stepped back and we looked at that situation and we saw there, yes, there was a choice. And one of the things that the enemy does to us over and over and over is he tries to back us into corners and he tries to make us feel like there's no choice. And I think that for, in my life, it's a huge thing that the Jezebel spirit does too. Because as a prophet, one of the things that you despise the most is restriction. Is someone backing you in a corner? Is someone feeling making you feel like you don't have a choice, that you have to do certain things. I mean, it's just, you know, and that's what that spirit does. It squeezes the life out of you. It squeezes the breath out of you so you can't speak, so you can't talk, so you can't share the truth. It makes you want to run away. It makes you want to get so far away from it. Um, I've spent some of my life running away, and sometimes I still want to run, and Yolanda has a pretty tight hold on me. She doesn't let me run, and I appreciate that. I do, because a lot of times in life when the enemy makes us feel like there's no choice, we just want to get away from that situation. But I feel like God is, like she taught on Sunday, God is uh, maturing us in this season where we can see. Remember part of this word? Um, I'm giving you new solutions for old problems. So he's going to give us choices in areas where we didn't think there were any choices, where we didn't think there was, there was any way out. Um, so he's, the enemy has conditioned us to stay in our box, but this is a season where God is giving us the freedom or we already have the freedom. We just don't understand it, but he's helping us understand our freedom in a way where we can get outside the box where we can see, I don't have to do this. I do have a choice. And so that leads me to another reason why people oftentimes stay in bondage. They stay in bondage because their identity gives them all these rules. And that can, we could, we talk about that all day long. I mean, that can even go into um, people talking about you as a victim, you know? Uh, and that's almost like, uh, and people keep saying these things about you and reinforcing that and it's a learned helplessness and you're living up to that identity. You know, that, that can go on and on about how the identity causes us to have certain expectations. But another thing I think uh, that the enemy does, and oftentimes it keeps us in that place of bondage, is um, he breaks our spirits. He breaks our spirits. And when you have a broken spirit, it's very hard to rise up and get out of that bondage. And a lot of times that's the place where we need someone, we need a brother or sister in Christ to say, hey, I see you. I see what's going on, let me help you. Even if you don't see it, even if you don't understand it, let me help you. And sometimes we act like that wounded animal where we attack the very people that's trying to help us. Um, we're going to have that in people. We're going to see that. We just got to put on the gloves and go on in and help them because we're going to get those type of people. They've been so wounded, they're going to resist all the help that people are trying to bring them. So um, I was, was uh, looking at uh, 
was looking on the internet and I was reading about some stuff and there's there's a lot on this but and I tried to fact check this to see if it was true and everything that I've I've seen about it it seems to be true when they train baby elephants have you guys ever heard about how they train baby elephants yeah and they train it for different purposes, and they do it a little bit different. You know, if you're, there's, some people are training them for a circus, and some people, like in Thailand, they're training them sometimes to work or sometimes to be ridden, you know, sometimes to do certain tricks, to paint or do things. But they, they go through a process called crushing. And they'll take these baby elephants. And in the wild, elephants are amazing creatures. They're very intelligent they live in like family groups they when they've been observed they display emotions they grieve when they mm-hmm. lose one of their family members they show joy they're very protective we've all seen those videos where the whole herd goes back and is helping the baby elephant you know get out of the mud or get out of the river and so they're very protective And usually the female elephants stay with their mothers for life. They're a family. And the males stay well into teenage years. And then sometimes, you know, they'll go off. But but they're they're very emotional. And um, they very much have ways that God designed them to, to thrive, to be who they were meant to be. But when people take these elephants and they they bring them into a a state of captivity, they have to break that spirit of everything that elephant knows. So when a baby elephant is very young, they they take it and they tie it up. Oftentimes they tie ropes around their legs and, and they'll tie a rope around its neck and they'll tie it to a larger elephant, not its mother, and they make that elephant pull it away from its mother. You know, and it's crying and you know everything elephants do. I mean, it's 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 so upset you can imagine. And they take this baby elephant and they tie it up. Uh, a lot of times on concrete, or they tie it up in an isolated area, and they they have a rope around it. And of course, the baby elephant is trying to pull away. I mean, it's trying to pull, it's trying to pull, but it's not very big. I mean, it's, it's a baby, and they pull and pull, and they leave this elephant there day after day after day, week after week. And a lot of times, month after month, up to six months, until this baby elephant stops fighting. It stops pulling away. And when they realize that it stopped fighting, they feel like its spirit is broken. And so now they can train the baby elephant. So now they take that elephant, and as that elephant grows, and they use a lot of other stuff, you know, tactics and things to poke the elephants with and shock and stuff when they're training them. But as this baby elephant grows and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, it's a huge, powerful beast. I mean, elephants in the wild can uproot trees. You know, that elephant could easily break out of any bondage that those trainers have it in. And it could overtake and it could run off and have its freedom. But it doesn't do it. Those elephants are bound by relatively very small ropes or very small, weak chains because it doesn't understand its own strength, its own power, because its spirit's broken. And a lot of times that's what the enemy does to us. The enemy isolates us. A lot of times that happens in isolation. The the enemy isolates us, the enemy breaks our spirit, and then he has us right where he wants us. And so even though we have the power, the resurrection power, the strength, We don't realize we do because our spirits are broken. And so I think that's a tactic that the enemy uses. And and I was looking at another situation. You know, the children of Israel, we all know that story in Genesis. You know, God made the promise to Abraham um, that he would make him a great nation and he would bless him and he would give his heirs the promised land. And so then fast forward several hundred years and the children of Israel are in Egypt. And they've been there for over 400 years. They're in bondage. They're in slavery. And uh, in, in this time, they, uh, God raised up Moses. And he told them, he said, uh, go, go set my people free. You know, get my people out of Egypt. So the first time he went to the children of Israel, you know, they were all on board. They were like, okay, let's do this. So he went to Pharaoh Gave the, broke the news to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh's like, no, and as a matter of fact, I'm going to make this worse on you. 
And so what he did was he said, you're still going to have to do the same slave labor you were doing. You're going to have to make the same amount of bricks every day, but we're not going to provide the straw, so you have to go out and find your own straw. So in other words, he was just crushing them even more. And so Moses went and he whined to God about it, and God you know, reiterated the promises. He said, this is what I'm going to do. So he said, go back and tell the children of Israel, remind them of the covenant I made with them. So in Exodus uh, 6, 2 through 9, God spoke to Moses and he said, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as Almighty God, but I did not make myself known to them by my holy name, the Lord. I also made my covenant with them, promising to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they had lived as foreigners. Now I have heard the groaning of the Israelites, whom the Egyptians have enslaved, and I have remembered my covenant. So go tell the Israelites that I say to them, I am the Lord. I will rescue you and set you free from your slavery to the Egyptians. I will raise my mighty arm to bring terrible punishment upon them and I will save you. I will make you my own people and I will be your God. You will know that I am the Lord your God when I set you free from slavery in Egypt. I will bring to you the land that I solemnly promised to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I will give it to you as your possession. I am the Lord. So Moses told this to the Israelites. I want you to hear this. But they would not listen to him because their spirit had been broken by the cruel slavery. They wouldn't listen to him because their spirits had been broken. So the broken spirits of the Israelites caused them not to be able to listen to Moses when he spoke the promises. So here we have the children of Israel, and they have the covenant promise from God. They know, they've been told, you know, all these years it's been told to them. This has been repeated. This wasn't something new. This was something they carried with them. They knew the covenant promise that God had promised to them. They also had the power. Because God said, I'm going to rescue you. I'm going to take you out of slavery. I am the Lord your God. I'm going to protect you. They had the promise and they had the power, but they didn't bring those two together in that unity, in that marriage, because their spirits were broken. And because their spirits were broken, they looked at their place of bondage. They looked at Pharaoh and they felt like he was bigger than the promise. He was bigger than God. So sometimes we can't receive the promise because our spirit is broken. And we we act like those things that are keeping us in bondage are bigger than God, are, are bigger than the promise. And so we know the story, and eventually they did get out of Egypt. But God had to show, you know, God didn't just send those plagues to show Pharaoh that he was powerful than the foreign gods. He also sent those plagues because his own children, the children of Israel, had to get to a place where they realized our God is powerful and he's worth worshiping. Because remember what what Moses had asked Pharaoh, let us go into the wilderness so we can worship our God. And so they had to get their minds straight. They had to get their spirits built up in a way that they realized this is a God we want to go out and we worship and worship. We we want to do this thing. And so in we can see in these situations that really these people, the, this, the elephants have the power to be free already. The children of Israel had the power through God to be free. But we're only as free as we are in our spirits. And their spirits were still in bondage. Their spirits weren't free. And so there's a lot of people today who are saved, but they're still enslaved. They're saved, but they're still enslaved. And I think back about the different bodies that I've been involved in, and there's nothing wrong. I have always said that every um, body of Christ, every church has their role to fulfill in the body of Christ. And so the important thing is not that everyone looks like us, but that everyone goes to the Lord and says, what is our destiny? What do you have for us? But I do know that in my journey through different denominations that a lot of times I was saved in those churches, but I was still enslaved because I didn't have the peace that we have to bring. 
And I think we're going to get a lot of people like that. And a lot of times people don't even know they're enslaved because that's just how their whole lives have been. They don't even know. They, they don't even know what it's like to not be that way. Um, I've seen that some with, with like stress in my life. And I was talking to a friend of mine about it a few nights ago. And I said, you know, sometimes we don't even recognize what shalom, what peace is. We're so used to the highs and the lows that at first when I started feeling that, it's, it's almost a flat. It's a flat. And you know what? I used to think that flat was like, wait a minute, am I depressed? Mm-hmm. Is this depression? You know, what is this? I've never felt this before. Um, I, I need to do something. I need to work something up, you know. And uh, I think prophets have a lot of... <laughs> <laughs> prophets have a lot of intensity in their relationship with the Lord. I mean, God takes you to the mountaintops, and you think it doesn't get any better like better than this. And then the next day, he takes you to the valley, and you think, oh my goodness, <laughs> how can I deal with this? You know, and that's that's the, um, I don't want to say the breaking, because we use that in an own sense, but that's the molding of a prophet. It is, and you have to be careful, though, that, it's the Lord is taking you in those on that journey and not the enemy. But so then when you feel that place of the absence of the pressure, all of a sudden you feel like you should be fighting for something, you know, fighting to find that next word from God or that intense experience because, you know, when you're not feeling it. So I'm in an interesting season right now, and I don't have it figured out, but, but God is, is teaching me what it means to be free. And what it means to not be, there's one thing to be moving forward up the glory mountain. It's another thing to be uh, trying to strive to grab a hold of things for fulfillment. To feel a place that man says, this is how you should feel in this time in your life. This is what you should be doing in this season of your life. This is what your life should look like. So those are kind, those are different things. And I... I don't have it all figured out yet, so if you guys have any stuff on that, let me know. But it's a journey. It's a journey that, that I'm on. Um, so what we need to look at in our lives is what are we enslaved to? What is that rope that doesn't really have power? But what is that little thing that's little in God's eyes, but in our eyes we've been trained to, to be enslaved to it or, or to be tied to that? What are those things in our lives? That we need to be free from and they're going to be things that we maybe haven't seen before we're going to see things in a new way god's going to just like this word said um he, he's going to unveil things we're going to see in a in a different way and sometimes it's going to come to you in such a way that it's going to seem so simple you're going to think it's not really it but god says don't reject those things don't reject the simple things because when he lifts the veil we're not searching in darkness anymore It's right there in front of us. So it is going to seem simple. It is going to seem uh, easy. So we can't walk in the fullness of power until we can walk in the fullness of freedom. And the reason why is just like at the end of this word, um, the Lord says uh, he couldn't give us all these things before, and power is one of them, while we're bound into captivity because the enemy would just capture those things. And the enemy would plunder. He would, he would take control of those things. So if we really want the fullness, if we want to walk in the fullness of power, we have to be free to use that power for the kingdom. Because if we're in captivity, the enemy's going to take what God meant for good and he's going to uh, shift it into something. He's going to use it. We're, we're not going to use it in the right way because we're still bound. We're still in bondage to things. So we have to be free so the enemy doesn't take captive the things that the Lord releases to us in this season. We have to be good stewards of what God is giving us. And I believe in this house that God is going to give us a lot. He's, he already has. He's going to trust us with a lot. But we have to be good stewards of what he trusts us with. And part of that is we have to be free. We have to be free to be used by God and not in captivity or, or enslaved to the enemy. So, we have the covenant promises, and we have the resurrection power, 
but we just need the freedom so we can bring those together. And that's what we're going to learn about. That's going to be our focus in this next year. I, I love in Leviticus 25, God spoke to the children of Israel, and he talked about uh, every seventh year was a sabbatical year. where They, they didn't plant crops. They let the ground rest. Um, and God provided enough for that year from, from the year before. And then after seven sabbatical years, the 50th year was the Jubilee year. And I turned 50 last year this year but last year and the Lord began to speak to me about freedom even at that even at that time um, again it began to speak to me about my jubilee year and so uh, during this year there's restoration of family restoration of land restoration of possessions there's an increase in your field God provides safety there's there's freedom this the slaves have to be released there's freedom from captivity freedom from oppression there's triple blessings um, the Jubilee is a time to sound your trumpet of freedom. It's freedom from Satan. It's freedom from debt, freedom from fear. So all kinds of freedom has to do with the Jubilee year. And so in Luke chapter 4, Jesus went into the synagogue and he was, he was reading and teaching the word. And so it was the tradition of that time when you read the word, you stood up. You stood to read the word. But when you began to teach the word, the Torah, you sat down. Because sitting was a posture of authority. A lot of times in our society, standing is a posture of authority. But sitting was a posture of authority. And so Jesus stood up and he opened the scrolls. And he was welcome. People were welcome to come in and, and, and read the scrolls. Not everyone could teach, but people were welcome to read the scrolls. So he stood up and he opened the scroll and this is what he read. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And so we know, uh, we just read that, that's out of Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 2. So after Jesus read this word, then he sat down. So by sitting down, what he was doing was he was assuming he was taking the position of a teacher, of a rabbi. So he was shifting into a different place. And uh, Jubilee was always a symbol of salvation to the Jews. And I want to just read this part to you. The rabbis taught that these two verses were a messianic prophecy. And everyone in that synagogue knew the acceptable year of the Lord was the great jubilee of Leviticus 25. So jubilee was always a symbol of salvation. This was the hope of Israel. This is what they were looking for. Um, that there would come a final jubilee when the Messiah would arrive and all the promises to Abraham and David would be fulfilled. They knew, they knew this passage well. I mean, they taught it to their children and their children's children. It was their hope. So when Jesus sat down to teach on it, that brought a lot of attention to him. All eyes were on him. They were all watching him. What's he going to say about this? So when he sat down, this is the only thing he said. He said, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. So that was really short. That's, that's all he said. But everyone else who taught on that said, someday, Someday this is going to happen. Someday the Messiah is going to come and there's going to be freedom and all these things are going to be fulfilled. But when Jesus sat down, he said, today. He said, today. So he was saying that everything you've been waiting for is here. Everything that has been prophesied is here. Jesus was saying, I am the Jubilee. I am the freedom. I am the Messiah. And so... In that very moment, it wasn't a year they were looking for. It wasn't a season. It wasn't, you know, how they celebrate it, waiting 49 years in the 50th year. But all of a sudden, it was a, it was in a person. It was right there before in the, in them. And so what I want us to keep in mind, the, the, what I want us to take away from this today is that in Jubilee, there is freedom. There is provision. There is safety. 
there's all those things that we're meant to be and there's all those things that we're meant to bring to the world and it can be summed up very simply in that Jesus is our jubilee Jesus is our jubilee so father I just thank you for this revelation that you brought to us today I thank you for this prophetic word that you've given us and I thank you for the pieces that you've given us to unpack and to unwrap and I just pray that you will give us even more revelation because we want to be good stewards of your word we want to be good followers of your word we want to put the action steps into the prophetic words that you're giving us Lord and we want to recognize the promises that you've made us Lord the promises that you've given to us through your word and the prophetic promises and father we want to take the power that we know is residing in us the resurrection power that comes through you and lord we want to bring those together in that covenant relationship where we can see the fulfillment of the promises and of the power and i just pray that you will show us lord those areas in our own lives that we still need to be free those areas that we're still in bondage that we're still in slavery those things that are trying to break our spirits, I just say no more in the name of Jesus. I just say that as you said, Lord, we are a house of healers. We are a house of healing. And part of that healing is deliverance and freedom from the bondage, from the bondage of sin. I just ask you, Lord, to highlight, Holy Spirit, any areas in our lives that we're still walking in sin that we don't see because sin is bondage, Lord. And we want to walk in complete, absolute, total freedom i just say that all these words that were spoken here today will be protected i just ask that as the angels have been surrounding this place the messenger angels that you will take these pieces into even those people who aren't here that are in our body in our sphere of influence in our realm of authority that you would deliver this message of freedom this message of peace this message of hope and this message of jubilee to them today in jesus name i pray